Hey, friends, welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is absolutely fascinating, uh, Dr. Vince Bantu. Um, this dude has a extremely long uh, CV, curriculum vitae. Um, he has a BA in theology from Wheaton College, MDiv from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, THM from Church History from Princeton Theological Seminary, and MA in Semitic and Egyptian Languages from the Catholic University, and a PhD in Semitic and Egyptian Languages from also uh, the Catholic University. He currently serves as assistant professor of church history and black church studies at Fuller Seminary. Now, it sounds like this dude is just nothing but just a hyper academic, but as he explains at the beginning, he pursued all of these academic credentials out of a passion for evangelism, apologetics, and mission. I was blown away with this conversation. This dude Dr. Bantu is an absolute master when it comes to the 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 growth of Christianity, the er, especially in the early like the early the first few centuries of the church, how there is massive growth um, of the church of the gospel in Africa, both kind of um, northern Africa and sub sahara Africa, and he is a, a an expert at all of this. And I was just you know, one of, the, one of those conversations where your learning curve is just like a hockey stick because you have just no knowledge of anything anybody's talking about. I was blown away at how much I learned in this conversation, and I'm sure you will too. So I, I'm stoked. I'm super excited for you to engage this conversation. So please welcome to the show the one and only Dr. Vince Bantu. All right, I'm here with uh, Dr. Vince Bantu. Uh, dude, your, your scholarly interests are pretty unique. So I, my first question is, you know, you did a PhD in Semitic and Egyptian languages. What, <laughs> where did that come from? I mean, Semitic languages, I get, okay, like, okay, Old Testament, ancient Near East, you know, Bible stuff, but Egyptian languages, like, has that always been an interest of yours or where did that come from? Yeah, you know, you know, it's really interesting. Um, I could even like answer that by way of recent anecdote. Uh, cause we were just chatting and I, I mentioned that I'm actually in Harlem right now. Uh, I'm in the area visiting my wife's family. And right before this podcast, uh, our recording, I actually visited, um, a museum here in Harlem. Uh, that's, uh, it's called the Genesis Museum of Black American, uh, Black uh, Culture and History. And the whole thing was all Egyptian themed. Like it was like they created really? it to be like an Egyptian temple. Uh, and, and, and the whole, point of the museum was helping African Americans right here in historic, you know, Harlem, uh, understand the, the pride of their roots, their Egyptian roots. Uh, and, and, uh, and this, this particular museum was part of a, a religious community that is really big here in New York City, uh, called the comedic or the conscious community. And these are African Americans and other people of African descent who reject Christianity and say that it's the white man's religion. Uh, and they, you know, mm -hmm. they, you know, teach people, uh, especially of African descent to reject Christianity and say, no, we, you know, that's, that's mm -hmm. the, that's a European imposition. And, you know, we need to return back to, uh, our original religion, which they would say is Egyptian because that's the, the oldest religion in Africa. And so, uh, yeah, so that's actually what, uh, you know, so I'm, I, I would say first and foremost, like I'm an evangelist and apologist, uh, and, and, you know, and really, a, a you know, a really a missiologist and with a heart for spreading the gospel, especially in my community, uh, in the urban African-American context. And in that context, this idea that Christianity is the white man's religion uh, is, is, mm -hmm. is, you know, really is without without rival the biggest, you know, challenge uh, to the spread of the gospel among among non-Christians or among people who reject Christianity. And so that's really what got me interested in learning about the African roots of Christianity uh, and really wanting to teach on that. And, and so I ended up you know, going to this program that actually where I focused on the Egyptian language, which was Coptic, uh, but that was actually a Christian language. And but not also like Ethiopian, Nubian mm -hmm. and just in general, that's what got me into learning about ancient African Christianity, because there's so many people who are interested in ancient African history. Uh, in my community. So I think it's really cool to say, well, if you're interested in that, it's really cool to see that actually most ancient Africans from the first century on were actually Christians. Uh, so, yeah. That's fascinating. So you're, cause when I, when I look at your CV, I mean, you, you're, you got some academic credentials, like crazy. What do you have? Three master's degrees, a PhD. So, but, so your academic interests were driven more by your missiological and evangelistic interests. That's, 
That's fascinating. Can, can you let's t- can you go? Let's just go back where you just left off. Give us a one on one history of the spread of Christianity into Africa, uh, especially. I mean, you said like the, some of the earliest forms of Christianity hit Northern Africa to take us to that world. And what was that like? You know, I, yeah. So, I, you know, uh, I, I always love to point out that, you know, when we're talking about the continent that we now call Africa, um, you know, which again, like in the ancient times, Africa would have just been like part of what we now call Tunisia. So like a real small region, uh, you know, and if you went to like ancient Nubia or, or ancient Ethiopia yeah. and you yeah. said, you know, Hey, I'm in Africa. They'd be like, no, you're not <laughs> Africa. Like, I don't even know where Africa is. That's like, uh, you right. know, but now we, you know, in the modern times, we call the whole continent that we, if we're, if we're talking about the whole continent, um, I always love to point out that, you know, in the time of the beginning of Christianity, that there was really four major kingdoms or regions, uh, in North Africa, there was what we call Roman North Africa, which, uh, were, you know, which is like Tunisia, Libya, Tunisia, Morocco, and, and uh, Algeria. Uh, and all of that was kind of the colonies of the Roman Empire. And they, they themselves actually used to be other kingdoms, but by the time of Christianity, they were all, you know, kind of brought under the Roman Empire. Uh, and that's where Latin was the main language. So people just collectively call it North Africa, like Roman North Africa. So there's that. Then there's Egypt, which also was a, its own country with a long history, but also by the time of Christianity was also colonized by the Roman Empire. So you got North Africa, Egypt, then south of Egypt, you have now you're getting outside of the Roman Empire. And that's when you have Cush at the time of the New Testament, which later became known as Nubia and, uh, the, you know, which is now Sudan. Then further south of that, you have what's now called Ethiopia, which at that time was called Agazi or Habesha, and the capital city was Aksum. So sometimes we call it the Aksumite Empire. So you have these four major regions uh, in Africa and other, you know, large kind of urbanized kingdoms in the continent didn't develop so much later. Um, you know, like, you know, Great Zimbabwe or the Congo or the Mali Songhai Empire, or even in like Chad, you have like the Khanim Empire, you know, those didn't come so much later. And so in the time of the beginning of Christianity, you have four major kingdoms. And the interesting thing is that mm-hmm. within the first few centuries of the church, Christianity was present in all of these regions. And not only was it present, wow. but it was actually the dominant religion. It was actually the majority religion in all of these regions. So again, that goes back to what I was saying is that you can't, if, if people are interested in studying Africa, you can't study African ancient history without studying Christianity and vice versa. You can't study Christianity without studying Africa because many of the most influential theologians were from Africa. You know, like in Egypt, you had Origen and Clement of Alexandria, Athanasius, who was uh, really integral in the fourth century around Trinitarian doctrine. And you also uh, had Cyril of Alexandria. Then in North Africa, you had some of the first women Christians mentioned in history, Perpetua and Felicity and Carthage, who are martyrs. You got Tertullian, who lived around the same time and was actually the first Christian to use the word Trinity. You got Augustine, who would later become the most influential theologian in you know all of Western Christian history. And then, in, but then again, you have also uh, in those are the names that might be a little bit more familiar to people because they wrote in the imperial languages in Greek in Egypt or in Latin in North Africa. Yeah. But yeah. also Christianity became written in the Coptic language, in the native Egyptian language. And that was with people like Pacomius or Shenouda the Great or uh, Benjamin of Alexandria, uh, you know, and then also Christians from Egypt wrote in Arabic. Some of the first Christians to write in Arabic were like Severus Ibn al And so these are names that we might not be as familiar with, which is, you know, actually in and of itself kind of proving the point <laughs> or at least uh, showing the understandability of people's idea that Christianity is a Western religion because we're more familiar with Christians who wrote in Western languages. Um, but then Nubia also had a, a, a whole Christian culture. They became a Christian kingdom because, again, they weren't part of the Roman Empire. And so in the in the 500s, Nubia became a Christian. The king became a Christian and Nubia became a Christian empire for a thousand years from the 500s until the, about the 1500s. Um, you know, the ancient church of Nubia that thrived for a thousand years is no longer around today, even though the Nubian people still are around today, but they're mostly Muslim now. But for a thousand years, they were a Christian kingdom and developed churches and monasteries and, 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 you know, texts and translations of the scriptures and, and liturgy that we can still see today. And then again, and lastly, further south from there, Ethiopia also became a Christian nation in the 300s, even before 
um, Nubia. And they are still a predominantly Christian nation mm-hmm. to this day. Actually, uh, back then, what, what's now Ethiopia and Eritrea were, were one empire. Uh, now they're two nations, and both of them are predominantly Christian and have a Christian tradition that stretches back to the 300s that also produce indigenous literature and liturgy and architecture that uh, and produce authors like Georgis of Sagla, the first documented sub-Saharan prose author in human history, was also a Christian systematic theologian and a monk. And uh, some of the first biographies of women from Sub-Saharan Africa were also from Ethiopia, people like Christos Samra or Walata Petros. And actually one of the first documented philosophers from Sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps probably the first, was named Zara Yaakov, who lived in the 1600s and wrote an entire philosophical treatise, which actually was just recently translated into English um, that just came out this year. And people can now finally read Africa's first philosopher, or at least sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so, I mean, these are just a few examples I could go on and on, but, but yeah, that, that's just like you said, the one-on-one. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, I am so blown away right now. So, yeah, the f- going back, the first several names you listed, Cyril of Alexandria, Clement, and all the, yeah, I th- I'm like, okay, I'm tracking, I'm tracking. And then you completely lost me with all the other names. <laughs> what, why, why is that? So, th- is, is it that once Christianity left the regions of Northern Africa under the Roman Empire, did it just get take on its own life form that was separated from the, I guess, both the Western and Eastern churches it spread and all of the names and church history that we're familiar with? Did it just become detached from that brand of Christianity? Or why is all this, why is this completely unfamiliar to me? Part of it might be an education thing, too. You know? Um. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, yeah, so I would say it, that question has a really sad answer, uh, and, and I kind of go into uh, into that in uh, the first chapter of my book, "Multitude of All Peoples," because um, you know we're, many of us today are familiar with the sad history of how Christianity has been weaponized by the Western world as a tool of domination, yeah. uh, colonialism, slavery, how. Uh, the you know the Europeans who came to the Americas and uh, you know spread diseases and and genocide and 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 even missionaries used Christianity to try to convert uh, indigenous peoples not only theologically but also culturally there was this idea that you know we have to kill the Indian and save the man and there's this idea that we have to make you European that your indigenous languages are are evil and demonic and we have and, and then you know same thing it was used to justify transatlantic slavery and the colonization of Africa colonization of parts of, of of Asia as well, you know, most of us are familiar with this history. And sadly, a lot of us think uh, or are told that Christianity actually first encountered people of the Americas, indigenous peoples or African people or, uh, or you know, South or East Asia, that it was in the middle of this colonial project that that was when Christianity was first introduced. So, you know, it's a little understandable why people would want to reject Christianity if they're like, well, if that's if, if it came with colonizers and and enslavers, then yeah, I would want to reject it. And so, but again, the the good news is, you know, historically is that that's not the case. That Christianity was in India, it was in China, it was in Central Asia along the Silk Road uh, among the Mongols. It was in, and as we just talked about, it was all over Africa, um, you know, long before Europeans came. And so, um, but you know the. Uh, the question uh, came up for me was, you know, how did we get to that place? How did, you know, if, if, if that's not all of what Christian history is, and, and biblically we know that's not what Christianity is supposed to be, uh, that the Bible is very clear that, you know, slavery and colonialism, these are evil things. These are not things that followers of Jesus can do. So, and, and we see in the Bible also that Christianity was, was involving everybody, right? That it went out from the Jews to the Gentiles. And we see in Acts 2 is all, all peoples, all cultures, all tribes. There, there was no, Nobody had a majority uh, culture in the church that it was it was uh, it was everywhere. In fact, if anybody may have had kind of some kind of cultural dominance, it would have been the Jews. But but Jesus and the apostles made it very clear, like, no, there's no Jewish dominance and no non-Jew needs to assimilate culturally to Jewish culture. Uh, and that was the big issue in Acts 15. So the New Testament goes out of its way to to forbid any kind of cultural dominance in Christianity. And yet that's exactly what happened eventually. And so, yeah, like, how did that happen? Uh, and I think the how of how that happened is the answer to your question of why we don't hear about some of these other names and some of these other Christians. And, 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 uh, 
you know, what I explained in the first chapter of the book is that I would say it really started with the conversion of Constantine, or at least the alleged conversion of Roman Emperor Constantine in the early 300s that that he started, uh, you know, stopped the persecution of Christians and started tolerating Christians. And, and many Christians even claimed that he was a Christian. Uh, you know, we don't know if he himself said that, but Christians certainly said it about him. And and then Christianity became the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, especially after the time of Theodosius in the late 300s. And so as Christianity became the dominant religion of the Roman Empire, it started to take on a lot of Roman culture that that even the way that church structure and leadership and even architecture was was made was mirroring the Roman political government systems. And even even theology and framing of orthodoxy was taking on Greco-Roman, Platonic, Stoic language. Now, that, that wasn't new in the 300s because Christians in the Roman Empire had always tried to articulate Christian theology uh, according to Greco-Roman thought. I mean, even John does that in the Gospel of John when he calls Jesus the Logos and yeah. Justin Martyr and, and other folks, Clement about it, they do that. But the, there, But at that point, though, there was no sense that that expression of Christianity was like the dominant, you know, framed way. But in the fourth century and going forward, that became the case. And it really came to a head at the Council of Chalcedon. So this is a, I don't, I know this isn't church history class. I would just say if there's, if there's one date or one event to answer that question, uh, that would be helpful to know. I would say it would be the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451, because at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, um, the, the dominant Roman church of the Roman Empire, uh, which was centered in Roman Constantinople and the bishops and with the support of the Roman emperor, they made a, an articulation of the humanity and divinity of Jesus, right? Which is ultimately a mystery that no human can fully explain how Jesus was fully God and fully human. But there was a the Pope of Rome at the time, Leo, he made a way of articulating that, that again, was really kind of rooted in Greco-Roman thought, where he said Jesus has one, per he's one person, but he has two natures. He's one who hypostasis, but he has two physics, right? Two different natures. And you know, that made sense to him. That made sense to people rooted in Greco-Roman Hellenistic thought. But to people in other parts of the world, that didn't make sense. And especially when you think about the fact that in Greek, you can say that one person has two natures and there's a difference. But other people in other languages don't even have two different words for the like word person and nature. And so they have different words. And so the Christians in the Persian Empire or the Christians in Ethiopia, the Christians in Nubia, the Christians uh, in Syria and Arabia, they they did not accept that. They did, that didn't make sense to them. Um, now, to be fair, it wasn't like the dominant Chalcedonian or dominant Roman position was heretical, but they thought it was. And what happened was the dominant church of the Roman Empire began to enforce that doctrine in North Africa and in Syria. And, and they didn't have jurisdiction in Persia, but the Persian church rejected that doctrine. And that was the first major schism in the church. So we, we, you know, we might know about the Protestant Reformation and kind of how that was a break between Catholics and Protestants, or maybe we even know about the East West schism in Europe between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholics in the 10 hundreds and the 11th century. But the Council of Chalcedon in the fifth century, that was the first major schism in the church. And it's a lasting schism. It has lasting effects because the churches of Egypt and Ethiopia and Eritrea and Syria and Arabia and the former Persian Empire, which is now Iran and Afghanistan, and, and actually that spread all the way to China and India, those churches, which are now, we could say, in the continents of Asia and Africa, those churches were split from the dominant Roman church, which later became the dominant influence in what would become Europe and Protestantism and which would go out to the rest of the world. So that is why most of us have heard of those first names I said, but those later names I was saying, yeah. we're not familiar with them because those Christian traditions were rejected as heretics and, and have been largely kept from many of us in the rest of the world. Wow. All right. You're smashing some paradigms here. Um, so what would... That's fascinating. Going back prior to Chalcedon, 451, let's go to Nicaea. Would the churches that were rejected by the Chalcedonian Creed, would they have still embraced the Nicene Creed? Or yes, Nicaea was more about like more Trinitarian articulation, right? But even like you have, you have Clement of Alexandria, right? Who or a Tertullian, who was kind of an earlier, earlier Trinitarian kind of thought leader, codified in Nicaea. Would the, all the church of the Nubian, Ethiopian churches have, would they be under Nicene kind of 
quote unquote orthodoxy, but not Chalcedonian. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and, and so uh, okay. all, all of the, you know, because these churches are still alive and well today, the Ethiopian Orthodox, Eritrean Orthodox, Coptic Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox, uh, all of these communities, uh, well, not all of them. Unfortunately, some of these communities did die out. As I mentioned earlier, the, the Nubia was a Christian kingdom for a thousand years, yeah. but the Nubian people are still around today in southern Egypt and northern Sudan, but they're not Christian anymore. There are no more Christians. And then also... Um, at least that traced their church back to that time period. And then also there was a thriving church in China from the 600s. There was a missionary from Persia who came to China and brought the gospel. And the church thrived in China for several hundred years. But it died out and it was persecuted. And so Christianity didn't come back to China until the arrival of Europeans. So there are a couple of examples of extinct churches um, but mm. for the most part, most of these Christians still are around today in Armenia. Armenia is still a Christian nation, like 100 uh, percent. And and it has been since the 300s. And it was a Christian kingdom before Constantine, actually. Um, the king of Armenia embraced Christianity yeah, before yeah. a decade before Constantine allegedly did. And and uh, Ethiopia is still a predominantly Christian nation. Egypt, the Christian community is smaller than it used to be, but it's still the Coptic Church is thriving. And so um, and all of these churches still embrace Nicaea. They still embrace the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and again, even the uh, the the issue of Chalcedon was, um, you know, they, they everybody involved in that debate was an Orthodox Christian. They just had different ways and different words and concepts for how to articulate the humanity divinity of Jesus. And so even, you know, uh, and, and see, this is my problem, because a lot of evangelical or Protestant or Western church history textbooks will often leave out these histories out of their textbooks. You won't read, you won't hear about a lot of these uh, people and names in most church history textbooks. Now that's starting to change a little bit. And there's some modern church history textbooks that are doing that, but it's still very little. And the majority will still dismiss these Christians and say, well, there was these heretics called Monophysites. Now, first of all, Monophysite, uh, it means one nature, and that's a pejorative term. That's not a term that they use to call themselves. So that's already being offensive to call them that. Um, but also they'll, they will tell the history of these Christians through the lens of their Western opponents uh, back from the fifth century. So they will say what the Romans were saying about them at that time, which is that you don't, you all don't really believe Jesus was actually a human. You only think he was divine because they were saying the Armenian church, Ethiopian, Syrian, Egyptian, all of them were saying, no, Jesus does not have two natures. Jesus has one nature. And they, and then the dominant church of Rome in Constantinople said, oh, well, when you say he only has one nature, you must mean that his nature is only divine and he's not really a human. And you guys are like docetists. Like you, you think he just appeared human, but he wasn't really human. That's not what they said, though. At no point did they say that. But all of these Christians from the beginning said, no, we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we affirm Nicaea. And we fully believe that Jesus is fully God and fully human. That was not that was never what people were debating. Nobody was debating if Jesus is fully God and fully human in one in one savior. But what they were debating was, can we speak of him as having two natures? That was the problem that they said, because to them, that seemed like they were saying there's two different Jesuses. And again, that's not what they were saying. That's not what Leo and subsequent Catholic Christians were saying. But that's how people took it uh, in these communities. And so they said, no, Jesus has one nature. But mm. they said his one nature is fully God and fully human. And so neither side is heretical, but they both saw each other as heretical. But the Roman church had the power, so they had the ability to enforce their doctrine and impose it and ostracize these Christians. And then when Islam rose in this part of the world, that just was the final nail in the coffin. And that really limited these Christians from being able to spread Christianity as they may have would have. But that didn't stop it. And, and we could talk about that maybe later. But Christianity still actually spread in, in further regions of Asia and Africa, even despite the fact that the Roman church uh, really largely oppressed uh, the churches of Africa and Asia for many centuries. Just to try to summarize, the the, the kinds of churches, uh, Nubian, Coptic, um, Ethiopian, that that were were labeled non let's just say non chalcedian are you saying they they didn't they they embraced both the full divinity and full humanity of Jesus that was not the issue it was the categories that the western church used to explain that tension that they just didn't resonate with but they never they embraced the full divinity and humanity of Jesus like that's not the debate 
That that's exactly right. Yeah, the, uh, you know, and and again, I'll, I'll just repeat it. I'll summarize it briefly because I know you know we had a lag, but that's exactly right. That the the Christians and we, you know, many of them will call themselves Neophysites, as in one nature. Uh, but the Christians of Armenia, Ethiopia, Egypt, Nubia, uh, they they all fully embrace the full humanity and full divinity of Jesus. One of the first Christians to respond to Chalcedon was actually the Pope of Egypt. His name was Timothy Elerus, and he wrote a long treatise called Against Chalcedon. And in that treatise, hmm. he goes point by point against Leo's tome of uh, Leo of Rome, his his tome or his argument. And in it, you can see clearly that he never denied and he fully affirmed that Jesus is fully God and fully human. But again, Timothy Elerus is not a name that shows up in most Western church history textbooks. And so it's really irresponsible for so many uh, Western Christians to dismiss these Christians as heretical when we've never actually even read their their writings and their doctrine for in their own words. And a lot of that is because they wrote those in yeah. languages like Syriac, Armenian, Coptic, Ge'ez, and those are languages that most historians are not familiar with. And I think going back to your former question, I think that there's no other way to say it than that another reason for that is Eurocentrism uh, and racism and white supremacy, that, his, that yeah. people, historians have always been more interested in European history, in Western history, in you know Western languages like Greek and Latin and later European languages, but people are just not is interested in Af ancient African or Near Eastern history. Uh, and so that's why most historians don't even know how to read the the theology that was written in many of these other languages and haven't, haven't directly. I mean, I'm right now, I'm in the middle of translating a um, the, the first documented Ethiopian author in human history. Right. Which is another way of saying the, the first wow. sub-Saharan African author, because before even before Nubia, there was an identified author or even before like uh, um, Timbuktu or uh, or, uh, you know, the Mali Empire or other parts of Africa. Ethiopia produced the first documented named author. And his name was Georgius of Sagla, who lived in the early 1400s and wrote a 700 plus page treatise. And I'm translating it for the first time ever into English. Uh, it's not available in English. Wow. And this is crazy. This is insane. Like this person's name should be known and their text should be available, but it's not. And there's an Italian translation, but I'm making the first English one. And, and it's just imagine if like nobody could read, uh, Calvin's Institutes or Luther's 95 Theses or, uh, mm. you know, or Augustine's, I mean, Aquinas' Summa, right? Like those things are, you can find those on your phone right now, like, and read them in English. But, but again, uh, you know, so much of these texts are not available. Uh, but, you know, again, that's slowly starting to change a little bit, but, um, but yeah. So you have different strand, you know, Christianity gets deeper into Africa. You said the Nubian church thousand years and then it kind of died out um what 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 caused the dying out was it just ongoing persecution until there's no more nubian christians left is that yeah that's a great question i i, I go into that a little bit in in my in the book uh, multiple peoples and and i would say um you know there it wasn't like one event it wasn't there wasn't like it wasn't persecution because nubia was ruled by christian kings from the 500s up until around the 1100s and in the 1100s that was actually a time when there was conflict between christians and muslims in fact um interesting little kind of just i guess factoid is um the uh, the Muslims, uh, the followers of Muhammad, when they conquered much of the ancient world in the in the 600s after the death of Muhammad, the only place in the seventh century that Muslims tried to conquer and failed was actually Nubia. The invading Arab Muslim armies came in and they mm. conquered Egypt, they conquered North Africa, destroyed Carthage, and they came and tried to invade Nubia and failed actually. Um, and and the Nubians defeated them. And so again, this is a you know Nubian Christians fighting against Arab Muslims invading in Africa, and the Nubians won, and they created a peace treaty. And that peace treaty lasted for I think over seven hundred years, and it's actually the longest recognized peace treaty in human history. Um, but because Nubia is right across the Red Sea, many Arabs were migrating over into Nubia over the centuries. In fact, even the peace treaty they made stipulated that Muslims and mosques in Nubia would, would be protected. Uh, and, and the sad reality actually was that 
Part of it also was that Nubia would send slaves to Egypt to the Muslim rulers of Egypt. So this was actually the beginning of sub-Saharan African slavery in mass. And that began the trans-Saharan slave trade, which lasted much longer uh, than the transatlantic slave trade. Transatlantic slave trade started in the 15th century, but trans-Saharan slave trade of, uh, uh, and then later spread along the Swahili coast in modern Tanzania, Kenya, Malawi. That actually resulted in the transporting of African people into India and China and the Middle East. And that actually is another thing we don't talk about, but, uh, and in Arabia as well, that lasted for even, even earlier. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, that actually, the, the a sad truth is that, that that actually started with Nubian Christians in uh, participating in slavery uh, with Muslim rulers of Egypt. Huh. But um, but yeah, anyway, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Arabs uh, were moving over into Nubia for hundreds of years and even intermarrying with Nubians. And uh, and so that was and then so you, you had really through intermarriage, you had a gradual increase of, of Islamic population in Nubia. And then it got to the point where uh, when, you know, New there was even a point in the 12th century where you had the first Muslim ruler in Nubia. And and then uh, Christian and then also as Christians in Egypt were beginning to decline in prominence uh, and in population uh, because the Nubian church was under the Egyptian church uh, theologically, ecumenically. So they relied on Egypt to get their bishops and to have ordinations and all of that. But as the Egyptian church was becoming more and more persecuted especially as a result of the crusade that Western Europeans were fighting. That, and again, remember, we talked about how the Christians of Egypt and Nubia were not cool with the Christians of Europe, the Chalcedonian Christians. And yet, nonetheless, the Muslim crusaders uh, who were fighting the crusaders, they associated their own Christians in Egypt, their Christian subjects with these Western crusaders. And the Egyptian Christians, the Coptic Christians were like, no, we don't have anything to do with that. that we're not even, we're not even the same kind of Christians as them. Um, but they were still persecuted because of the crusades and in the, you know, 11th and 12th century. So that greatly diminished the ability of the Egyptian church to communicate with the Nubian church. And so it just was a steady decline. And then uh, by the, about the 14th century, that was the last time that there was a, a Nubian Christian king and, and there was no more correspondence with Egypt. Uh, and then it just gradually became Islamic. And I think the last mention of, uh, of Nubian Christians was around the late 15th century. And then it just eventually died out, unfortunately. Wow. This episode is brought to you by Seminary Now. Seminary Now is a subscription-based streaming video platform that delivers exclusive biblical, theological, and practical ministry training from a diverse group of leading educators and thought leaders. Uh, it's become one of the go-to resources for pastors, church leaders, and lay Christians who are serious about ongoing learning in our increasingly complex world. Seminary Now's 80 plus streaming courses and 10 plus live online classes allow learners to have access to world-class scholarship and cutting edge ministry training anywhere, anytime. Uh, these courses are taught by leading professors and authors like Vince Bantu, uh, Dennis Edwards, Michael Bird, David Fitch, Nijay Gupta, this is like a Theologian Raw All-Star team, uh, Carmen Imes, Sandy Richter, uh, Derwin Gray, Esau McCauley, Lynn Coet, Craig Keener, John Walton, and many, many others. Topics range from Bible, theology, uh, ministry, and uh, contemporary issues. Classes are they're broken up into short videos so you can learn at your own pace. And there's new courses being released every month. It's uh, The courses are available either on your smartphone or on Apple TV. You get unlimited access to all the courses for just 15 bucks a month, which is billed annually. Um, so I would, man, there's just so much here. I would highly encourage you to at least go check it out. Seminarynow.com, okay, to find out more. That's seminarynow.com. And for a limited time, uh, you can use the discount code TITR and save 30%, okay? Save 30%. The discount code is TITR to save 30%. Go check it out. This episode is sponsored by the Pour Over Podcast. Oh my word, I love the Pour Over Podcast. It is a trustworthy news resource guiding people toward eternal hope. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not conservative, it's not liberal. Instead, it is a Christ-centered summary of the major events going on in politics and in culture. Uh, like most of you, I am so tired of news outlets that are so clearly biased toward the right or to the left. I want to stay informed with what's going on, but I hate how traditional news outlets shape my heart and try to win me to a certain side. I mean, if you don't believe me, just ask yourself this question. After listening to, say, I don't know, CNN or Fox News for like 30 minutes, am I less or more or more motivated to love my neighbor and my enemy? 
If the answer is less than Houston, we have a huge problem, a discipleship problem. This is why I'm so excited about the Pour Over podcast. Each episode is only about seven minutes long, and they just tell you about what's going on in the world. They don't tell you how to interpret the various events or how you should feel about what's going on. Instead, they just let you know about the facts of what's going on while reminding listeners that our ultimate identity and hope is in Jesus Christ. I've even met some of the people at the pour over and they are super awesome. They're not some like closeted liberal or closeted conservative think tank. Um, Like they're truly genuinely just trying to keep us informed while staying focused on Christ. So Don't let traditional media outlets steal your affection away from loving people who might vote differently than you. Instead, check out and subscribe to the Pour Over podcast in your favorite podcast app. I I was actually going back to your point about the slave trade. I I was in Zanzibar in Tanzania a few years ago, and Zanzibar was a major, like, uh, port city. I think it was a stone city, what it's called, the major city in Zanzibar. And yeah, I, I learned, I had no clue about this, but that was a major trade route um, where slaves were shipped up to um, uh, up the coast and into India. And um, yeah, there's a whole part of my, the world that just, it's like so much going on that I just have no clue about the history. It's fascinating. Um, so the, the Coptic church though, that's been in existence since the beginning, right? Uh, is that, has that had an uninterrupted history and and he said it's still very much i mean still a minority religion in egypt but it's decent size right oh absolutely in fact i i've heard that the coptic orthodox church is actually the largest christian denomination of any you know branch of christianity catholic <laughs> orthodox uh you know protestant pentecostal it's the largest christian community in the muslim world uh, and so, yeah, it's still very much uh, wow. thriving. And, and, and their, their tradition is that the Apostle Mark came to Egypt and, and grew the church and uh, passed on the church. For, and he was the first uh, pope. In fact, the word pope was first used in Egypt in reference to the patriarch of Alexandria. And, and they hold that Mark was the first patriarch. And even to today, there's been an uninterrupted line of patriarchs. And even to today's current Pope Tawadros. And so there uh, and, the, and the church continued to grow. And, you know, there, there's people debate whether or not Mark actually went to Egypt. But one thing that's clear is that Christians were in Egypt from the very beginning of the church. Uh, I mean, you know, we see the Bible mentions Egyptians yeah. at Pentecost. And 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 then, you know, the first actually the oldest Bible fragment, uh, the uh, piece of the Gospel of John was from Egypt. And the first seminary uh, that was known it was it came out of Egypt, Clement of Alexandria in origin. And so there was a strong Christian tradition. And as you mentioned, you know, they, the Christians became the majority in Egypt. Uh, and then even when the Muslims conquered at first in the seventh century, Christians were still the numerical majority. And actually, Christians and Muslims got along pretty, pretty well uh, from the seventh up until about the 10th century. Again, as I mentioned, the Crusades really largely messed that up for Christians in, in Egypt. And then you started to have um, persecution of Christians by, uh, by Muslims. In fact, the last known text, Coptic text, uh, was actually a martyrdom story about a, a person named John of Fahani Jawait, who was martyred by um, by the Islamic rulers in the 13th century because of his refusal to convert to Islam. And so you started to have, that's, that's, that was the period where uh, Coptic as a language really died out and Arabic rose. So even today, most Coptic Christians speak Arabic um, and they don't speak Coptic. It's a, it's a dead language in that sense of being a living language, unfortunately. Uh, but one thing I think is really cool is that you know, even today, the Coptic Christians, which are uh, like somewhere around like 15 percent of the Egyptian population. And there's a large community in the diaspora, especially in the U.S. and Southern California and New Jersey and also in Australia and other places. Um, but, yeah, that that community still uses the Coptic language in their liturgy, which I think is really cool that if you go in any uh, Coptic church, you'll see Coptic icons with the writing in it and they'll sing liturgy and 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 use it, read the scriptures in the Coptic language. And I just think that's really cool because the Coptic language is the last phase of the Egyptian language, which is like, you know, one of Earth's oldest languages, right? Like one of the oldest languages in the world. And 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 you can still hear it being uttered and you can still see it being written uh, in its final phase. And I just think it's really cool to think about the fact that uh, the only people who are keeping one of Earth's oldest languages alive, Egyptian, 
are Christians, mm-hmm. right? It's actually uh, Coptic Christians who are still, you know, the the cultivators. And I just think going back to the earlier thing about people seeing Christianity as a white man's religion or as a Western religion uh, or as a threat to African identity, uh, I think it's really cool to think about the fact that Africa's oldest language is actually still being preserved today by Christians. Christians are the only ones doing it. Uh, and that are at least the, that are the ones that are doing it at the highest level. It's fascinating. And so isn't, isn't Coptic similar to Syriac? And Syriac is akin to Aramaic, right? Which is cousin to Hebrew. Or what's the relationship between those? I'm reaching back like 20 years in my <laughs> early PhD days when I took a class on Aramaic and they explained it all. But um yeah, yeah. No, no, they're, they're not related at all. In fact, that's, that's probably why, uh, my, my department that you mentioned, I got my degree from is called the Department of yeah. Semitic and Egyptian Languages, you know, uh, because actually the, uh, Coptic was the, was the only one that we really focused on. I think now they've added, uh, Armenian as well, which is also not a, uh, a Semitic language, but most of the languages that we focused on in our department were Semitic. Um, you know, even, even Ge'ez, which is a, the, the, the classical language of Ethiopia is actually a Semitic language. As you mentioned, uh, Syriac is also a Semitic language it's a dialect of aramaic um and uh that, that was you know spoken around an area okay. named Osrahini, and the capital city was edessa and but the, the you know the cool thing about syriac is that right, that right. that language can really rightly be considered as the foundational language of the asian church and we can literally use that word asian in an all-encompassing way because that church that that language and and theological tradition started in what's now uh northern syria and south south southeastern turkey uh, Western Asia, but it literally spread all over the Middle East and the Arabian Peninsula. It it was the language, East Syriac was the language of the Persian church of the Persian Empire, which is modern Iran and, and, and Afghanistan. And then from there, missionaries, as I said earlier, went mm-hmm. along the Silk Road in modern Mongolia, Uzbekistan, and then all the way into China and all the way down in India. Um, and they were still using Syriac. Uh, even even in all these different languages and cultures that the church was spreading, they were still using Syriac. And there's even interesting evidence that that church spread into southeastern Asia before the arrival of Europeans, that the first Europeans that came and traveled to southeastern Asia, Thailand and Indonesia and Singapore, actually said that there were Christians, Syriac speaking Christians in those places that that were connected to the Persian church long before Europeans got there. Um, but yeah, so Syriac is a really important language for church history. Uh, but yeah, it's a Semitic language. So yeah, there's no, uh, relationship to yeah. Egyptian. Uh, uh, you know, the Coptic is the, is the last phase of the Egyptian language. So, you know, it went from hieroglyphics, uh, to hieratic to demotic. And then Coptic yeah. was the final phase. And that was when it was the Egyptian language, but being written with Greek letters. And mostly Greek letters, but there actually were a few Egyptian letters that were retained because they made sounds that the Greek alphabet couldn't make. And and that was the final phase from around the first century up until the 13th century that the Egyptian language's final phase was the, that 1300 years when it was known as Coptic, mm-hmm. which is just another word for Egyptian, right? Uh, like Aiguptos comes into Coptic. And that's one of those, what they would call a Nilo-Saharan oh. language, which uh, linguists kind of use that term, but yeah. T- talk to us about the tenets of like the Coptic Christian church. If I, if I went, uh, and I, I've, I've been to Egypt just once a long time ago. And I remember, and at that time I was like, what, 21 years old. I remember being shocked meeting somebody who was Coptic Christian. I'm like, wait, I thought you're all Muslim down here. You know, <laughs> so ignorant, you know? Um, but I, I never actually got to go to a Coptic church. I was only there for a week. What, what would be, uh, other than them not being Chalcedonian in their particular expression of the divinity, humanity of Jesus, like what would be some of their features that would be maybe most uh, different from a more Western form of, of Christianity? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I would say in many ways, um, as you mentioned, like the, the Chalcedonian issue, that's, that's really the only like doctrinal issue between the Coptic church and other, you know, and, and, and these other church. In fact, these, you know, all these communities we're talking about that go back to antiquity, the Ethiopian, Armenian, uh, Eritrean, e- Egyptian Coptic church, even the, the Indian or Orthodox communities today that are still around. The, the main issue is, is Chalcedon. But other than that, they're on the same page with the rest of, you know, the Christian world and especially with the rest of okay. the Eastern Orthodox world. So they, that, that, that community of churches that I mentioned, they're often called today Oriental Orthodox, uh, or, um, you know, the Miaphysite churches. And, uh, and they're all, you know, that the main thing that differentiates 
Oriental, so-called Oriental Orthodox from Eastern Orthodox is the Chalcedonian issue. That's really the only issue. Other than that, they're actually very similar to Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox. But as you mentioned, they all still have cultural differences. And so Egyptian Christianity, for example, is very similar doctrinally, even in terms of liturgy. But, you know, there's differences. As I said, you'll see the Coptic language on the walls everywhere. Uh, and you'll see Egyptian saints mm-hmm. who are being celebrated that might not show up, you know, in a Greek Orthodox or in a Russian Orthodox. And, and again, certainly not using the Coptic language in other Orthodox churches. And I would say probably one of the, you know, uh, I mean, th- this, this is something that's in all Orthodox and Catholic Christian communities and even Protestants, I would argue, try to do their own version of this. But monasticism, uh, Christian monasticism is something that is huge in Coptic Christianity uh, because they are okay. really seen as the inventors of it, which isn't really true because there were Christian monks in Syria and in the Near East and in the Levant even before. You know, but people, you know, we think of people like Anthony the Great. And Pacomius and the Desert Fathers and Desert Mothers and Macarius and many of these people, they, they were certainly more famous. And even the monasticism that grew in Europe, in Western Europe, like in Ireland and, you know, you think of St. Patrick and Scotland and, and, and France and Central Europe and Germania, they actually imitated the monastic practices of Egypt. And uh, in, in their formulation. And so monasticism is still in the Coptic Church, a very huge part of, of Christian uh, identity. And I would also say that even the theology of persecution uh, and the theme of persecution and martyrdom is, is really big in Coptic Christianity that is very different. Right. Because in the history of the West, you know, Western superpowers have always likened themselves as these Christian kingdoms or Christian nations and uh, that that, you know, have, have Christianity largely influencing them. So in that world, in that framework, Christianity is the religion of the winners. Right. And it's the it's the religion uh, that is in line and in league with the state, with the presidents or with the empires or whatever. But, you know, Coptic Christians have always been in a, in a situation of persecution. Always from the very beginning, because, you know, under the Roman Empire, they were persecuted and martyred and and produced some of the early Christian martyrs. And then they were persecuted by Roman Christians because of the Chalcedonian issue. Uh, And then they were persecuted by Muslims and have been ever since the 600s and even still are to this day. Uh, Even just a few years ago, there was a group of Coptic Christians in Libya who were assassinated, who were killed uh, on a beach and were beheaded. And they they are you will you will find in many Coptic Christians icons of those Christians who were just killed like a few years ago um, for their faith next to Christians who were killed for the faith like 1500 years ago or almost 2000 years ago. And so there's this continuing theme of persecution and and it engenders in the Coptic church, I think, a boldness for the gospel. It's a very common, I mean, it's just maybe a smaller kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, example, but it, it, it speaks to a deeper issue is that in, in Egypt today, where Christians are still marginalized in many ways, um, they, it's, it's very common to have Coptic Christians will tattoo the cross on their wrist. And that's just another way of their yeah. boldness for the faith. And, and oftentimes those Coptic crosses will have the Coptic language written around the cross. And, and that's just a way of boldly declaring their faith in a context, in an environment where their faith and their identity is often, uh, you know, is threatened. And so I think that's that's another, I think, unique and really, uh, I think, all really also uh, aspect of the of Coptic just Christian culture. I like that. I mean, would that be cultural appropriation if I got one of those Coptic crosses on my on my on my wrist? I'm, you say yeah, that's I'm not sure. To, I, since I'm not, not Egyptian, Coptic. I couldn't speak on that. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I will say uh, <laughs> my my family and I we just took a, a trip up to New Hampshire uh, and actually really enjoyed it. Um, but it was really weird. I kept seeing all these like people in New Hampshire, these white people with 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 locks. Uh, and I was kind of like, hmm, that's kind of weird. Uh, but like, yes, yeah, so I don't know if it'd be I don't know if it'd be something like that. But maybe we should ask one of our Egyptian friends. Maybe I don't know. Maybe they're cool with it. <laughs> yeah. It was that tattoo that, that now that I think of it, when I was in Egypt, I remember it was like a shopkeeper or something. And I remember he was selling me something and I saw the cross. I'm like, wait, cross, you know, and I, you know, had a brief dialogue with them. But yeah, it was, it was that cross on the wrist that, yeah, showed he was Coptic. Um, what about, what about the ecclesiological structure? Is there like a central authority? Is there a role of Mary? Like, you know, is there anything like within our more familiar, you know, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, ecclesiological structures that are similar in the Coptic Church? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, there, I think that in that 
you know, in that area, there's a lot more similarities because, uh, you know, I mentioned role of Mary. I mean, Mary uh, is venerated in a way that's very similar to, you know, Eastern Orthodox and, and even Roman Catholics in the Coptic okay. and in many other, uh, you know, again, so-called Oriental Orthodox churches. Uh, in Ethiopia in particular, Mary has a very high, I mean, I, I don't know, it's hard to say because I think Catholic Orthodox, they all have a very high, um, you know, view of Mary, but e- Ethiopian Orthodox in particular, especially under the, uh, reforms of King Zariaco in the 15th century, where he actually had a, he wrote a whole series of of, of texts that are called Dersan, which is actually a unique uh, genre of literature to Ethiopia about Mary and in honor of Mary and just the veneration of Mary. Interesting, interesting little fact also uh, is that even before the Protestant Reformation in Europe took place, there was actually a reform movement in Ethiopia that took place a century before Martin Luther and it was started by uh, an Ethiopian monk really? named Estephanos, uh, which is just a, kind of a, another version of Stephen. And he actually was protesting many of the same things that Martin Luther protested, like, you know, the this, the state or the empire involving itself in ordinations and, uh, you know, placing scripture as a higher authority than than church teaching, uh, church hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, but also one of the things that he protested was the veneration of Mary that King Zariaco was strongly promoting in Ethiopia during that time. And in fact, one of the first painters, one of the I think probably the first documented or named artist in the history of sub-Saharan Africa uh, was in Ethiopia at this time. His name was Frey Sion, and he painted many uh, really beautiful paintings of Mary and Mary was huge and they, he would make these similar and other artists in Ethiopia imitated his style of these Marian icons and they were Mary was very central uh, in that but but across you know the tradition as well and but Stephen was actually uh, resisted praying or bowing or to icons of Mary uh, during that time in the 15th century before Luther in the 16th century mm. um, so yeah the, the veneration of Mary is very uh, very big and and in Ethiopian theology, Mary's womb being the bearer of, of Christ and the salvation of the world is is like, you know, theologically and typologically associated with like the Ark of the Covenant, which is seen as, you know, is believed to be held in Ethiopia. And just like the Ark is the holder of the law, which, you know, Moses gave forth to the Israelites that Mary's womb is the producer and the keeper of Christ, who is the fulfillment of the law. And so even in every church which celebrates Jesus, there's always a holy of holies and a replica of the ark. And so a lot and a lot of that is associated with Mary as the church, the ark, Mary's womb, and the church, uh, and, and the Ark of the Covenant are all kind of seen as mirror images of each other. And so yeah, Mary is a high, you know, role. And then similarly to the Catholic Church, there's a line of, you know, you mentioned like church authority and there's a idea of apostolic succession. So the idea is that Peter is the the throne of Peter is in Rome. And so, the, you know, there's the papal succession. And in the same way, the Coptic church goes back to Mark and uh, the Ethiopian church also and Eritrean consider themselves under mm-hmm. Mark as well under the Coptic church. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, the church of India sees Thomas as their apostolic uh, throne and, and the, the Syrian Orthodox church sees uh, Thaddeus, uh, the apostle as, as the, the, the um, apostle who brought the gospel there as well. So there's a similar structure of having a, now in most of these communities, they, instead of using the word Pope, they usually will use the word uh, patriarch and uh, who's the head of the church uh, under which there's mm-hmm. bishops and cardinals and, and priests that are ordained in a similar way as Catholics. And in the church of the East, which was the dominant church in the Persian empire uh, that later spread all throughout Asia, as I mentioned earlier, they call their head of their church, the Catholicos, uh, but it functions in similar way as like a patriarch or uh, which is also what Greek Orthodox used to refer to their head and then, or as a pope in the Western tradition. What, what about the canon? Are, do they follow a Western, Eastern, or a different kind of canon? How What books do they have in their Bible? Is it similar to the Protestant church or Catholic church or something different? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great question. You uh, In many of these church traditions, uh, they would be more similar to Catholic in the sense of including uh, the Deuterocanon in their uh, in their in their canon and, and in their, you know, it's in their church canons and and liturgies uh, and, and it's you know, seen as authoritative, whereas in most Protestant circles, those books are usually not included, um, the Deuterocanon. And um, that, and, the, and the, but for the most part, you know, Syrian, Coptic, other Orthodox views, their canon is going to be similar uh, to, you know, uh, Roman Catholic. Catholic, but um, the Ethiopian church actually has even more books and actually has the largest canon uh, in the history in the, in the entire Christian world, uh, because they, I think of 81, I I think, uh, I think it's 81 uh, books in their canon. And it includes not only the Deuterocanon, but it even includes a few books 
that only survive in the Giz language, which Giz is the classical language of Ethiopia. It's not spoken anymore today, but the modern languages of Ethiopia descend from that language. Many of them do. And their alphabet that's used today, it comes from that alphabet. And, and those books like the Book of Jubilees or the Book of Enoch, uh, those only survive, actually. Even though they were likely written in Hebrew, they only survive in the Giz language. And so the Ethiopian Orthodox yeah. and the Eritrean Orthodox Church embrace those in part of their canon. Uh, and, and that's so that's a unique, um, you know, a unique example as well. And the book of Enoch first talks a lot about like the watchers uh, and and kind of those the Nephilim and the mentioned in Genesis and and, you know, these different cl- categories and classes of angels. And so because of that, you'll see them in church icons and they feature a lot more prominently in the theology and worship and, and, and literature of the Ethiopian and Eritrean churches. That's fact. So my, my degree it was largely in early Judaism. And so, yeah, very familiar with those texts. And I remember when I did research on them, a lot of the original that's been preserved are like Ethiopic and Coptic and all these Syriac. And I'm like, holy, like I can't learn all these languages. So I was relying on English translations, but so, so one Enoch is canonical in the Coptic Coptic church. Is that in the, in the Ethiopian church and the, and Eritrean in the Ethiopian and Eritrean Ethiopian churches. Church. It is. Oh, interesting. Oh, interesting. Oh, man. Uh, Vince, I've taken you. I know you got a meeting and I, I've already made you late for it. We had to s- squeeze in this. Uh, it was hard to schedule this. So we had to squeeze in uh, some time. But man, th- this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for uh, the whirlwind tour of, of a branch of Christianity that to my shame and to the shame of I, I know a lot of people listening uh, we're just either completely unaware of or just, you know, uh, largely unaware of. So thanks so much, man, for the history lesson. This has been super, super helpful. Uh, where can people find your work? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this it was a pleasure. And thank you. Uh, I'd love to be back again. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I have a, a few books uh, out and, um, you know, folks are interested. They can check that out. Uh, Multitude of All Peoples with University Press. And uh, and then also I have a book with the University of California Press, uh, Those for Whom the Lamp Shines, which really just focuses on Egypt. And then also, um, you know, uh, I've done a lot of uh, work as well in the area of, the, you know, of African-American theology uh, with um, Urban Ministries International. So a book called Gospel Hymenode. And then also we have a Hymenode journal. Uh, and then also you can just check out things I'm doing with the Meacham School of Hymenote, uh, H-A-Y-M-A-N-O-T, uh, which is a, a is word for theology. And uh, yeah, the Meacham School of Hymenote, uh, M-E-A-C-H-U-M, uh, you know, Meacham.org. You can find out uh, stuff we're doing. And we have a theology conference coming up in the fall that we'd love to mm-hmm. see, you know, have people out at. And uh, when we get into a lot of this history, as well as just other, uh, you know, uh, other matters of biblical theological research for uh, scholars of African descent. Um, but all are welcome and to be part of it. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's a, you know, checking out the website and just that's a good way to see uh you know, some of the stuff I'm up to, but I also have videos on YouTube and uh, that people awesome. put up and then also, uh, uh, you know, I'm on Facebook and I'm, I'm on Twitter and uh, Instagram, but I, I, I'm old. So I just look at Facebook. My kids tell me Facebook for old people. So I'm, I'm living into that stereotype. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Vince. Really appreciate the conversation, man. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.